Greetings in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this is an uh, online prayer series and we have done a very interesting little series called Love Your Enemy. And last week, it sounds very serious uh, in the sense that we outlined the fact that uh, you need to know that loving your enemy does not mean fellowship with your enemy. Because uh, some people think loving your enemy means uh, every day go out and have lunch and uh, satay or uh, wonton noodle or chicken rice with your enemy day after day. No, 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 no. There are verses that tell us we have to uh, separate the sense of fellowship from uh, unforgiveness against the enemy, which means that we have to have a, a sense of praying for our enemies and asking that God will restore them, that God will change their heart and mind before they fall deeper into the the gates of hell, uh, through the gates of hell into hellfire. So as we begin to teach about loving your enemy and looking at all the principles and remember some of the ostracization of uh, our enemy are uh, actually from the New Testament. And, uh, and, and these are New Testament people who follow our Lord Jesus Christ, like Paul telling them, have nothing to do with those who cause divisions and uh, avoid them. And then uh, in, in Second John, where John says, don't even uh, have anything to do with those who spirit of Antichrist. We realize that when we put all the scriptures together, that is definitely saying, have no fellowship with the enemy. That is 100% sure. But we need to uh, identify uh, different types of enemies and understand that the treatment of each one of them is not, and as well as say what is not an enemy. Because we don't want anyone who hear this series and then they run around thinking everyone is an enemy who is not an enemy. <laughs> right. Firstly, people who disagree with you are not your enemies. And in fact, your best friends are those who can tell you as it is uh, pulling no punches. It's like iron sharpens iron. And uh, it's where uh, good people can be honest with each other and tell each other what they're thinking instead of trying to be polite in your thinking, polite in your words, and you have to walk like uh, on eggshells in front of each other. Who in the world wants a relationship full of eggshells uh, that you're afraid to, to, to crack? That's not a comfortable relationship. That is like catering only to one side. In any relationship, both parties must cater to one another. It cannot be one side walking on eggshells uh, on the other, and the other side doing what they want. And uh, it's not a normal relationship. That's an abnormal relationship. A true relationship is where you can be honest with each other, honest about yourself, and be transparent to each other, hiding nothing. Even if it hurts, even if um, you know there's misunderstanding and it might take time to understand each other, it's better to be honest and transparent. And so, uh, people like that are not your enemies. They are there probably. God put them there in their, uh, in your life to help you. So don't make good friends and good people. See, good friends are not yes men around you. Neither are good friends no men around you. <laughs> people always like to use the word yes man where everyone, uh, no, everyone around say yes, 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 yes. You have to do this, yes, yes. You have to do this, yes. They don't disagree with you. They don't know how to uh, say, no, that's not a good way to do this. They don't dare to say that. Everything you want to do, just do. And you go around, you know, do whatever you want. That's not the kind of, you don't want yes men around you. Neither do you want no men around you. Who are the no men? This is my invention. No men are those who say, cannot do, cannot do this, cannot do that, cannot do, you know, this is no way. I always find a way to discourage you from being brave, being, being bold, from doing uh, something. They're always finding the no. And so that's also not good. A good person knows how to say yes and know how to say no. And they are not your enemies. Now, here's a Bible verse that talks about good friendship. It says here in uh, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. The meaning is that a good friend is one who can disagree with you, agree with you, but who is honest with you because no one will tell you what uh, people don't like about you because they are afraid of you. 
But your friend will say, hey, actually, a lot of people don't like this part about you, you know? And I just want you to know that. But I'm still your friend, I still love you. And so, it is important to know that if you look at the mirror and you only see yourself the way you are and the way you think you are, it's just like, you know, we always see ourselves internally, we all have an image of ourselves, correct? You might think you are a very generous person, but you'll be surprised to find out that everybody thinks you're a stingy person. Isn't that a surprise? Or you might think you're a very nice person, people around you think you're a horrible person. Wouldn't it be terrible? Especially if 99.9% .9 of people think that it's so, and only uh, the one yes person in front of you don't dare to say that, and plus yourself think that you're a nice person when you're a horrible person. And uh, so in the end, what benefit do we have of people who don't tell us the correct things or the truth? Uh, and it's better to, to know the truth and tell the truth so that if there's something that you can change in your life, change it now in this life rather than be stuck with it and bring it to heaven and then God has to deal with it. It's better to deal with it so that we become better people, become more like Jesus and uh, grow into Christ-likeness. So may I remind you that uh, uh, a person who tells you it is, who is blunt to you, who speaks their mind, whether they are right or wrong, at least the one thing you can appreciate that they are honest with you, are good people and they are not necessarily uh, people that you should classify as your enemies. So don't make such people your enemies, they could actually be the best friends that God put into your life. And uh, of course, if they are really good friends, they know how to balance between encouragement and discouragement to make sure you're not discouraged by their correction, etc. Uh, but good friends are rare and you find them, you should learn how to keep them and nurture good relationships, especially when they are spiritually benef beneficial and so beneficial and you strengthen each other in the way of the Lord. And you could be... Uh, encouraging each other in the way and in the walk with the Lord. So nurture such good friendships. I've tried as much as I can in my relationship with those uh, around and those who have time to fellowship with to always be as honest, as blunt as can be possible. And um, sometimes when a friendship or relationship is new, you cannot straight away directly be too blunt uh, in case people get hurt. But isn't it wonderful if you can find a relationship where you don't, where you can be honest and the other person don't have to feel hurt because of your honesty? Uh, and that would be the best kind of relationship. And in fact, uh, uh, we, you should pray, we all should pray that each husband and wife relationship should be like that. That all husbands and wives should be first friends and then also lovers. And, um, so if you have uh, friends who are honest or like iron sharpen iron, no, they are not your enemies. They are actually good friends. And if they are too discouraging, tell them, hey, next time when you do that, please encourage a bit more. I'm sure they will do that. And so they are not your enemies. So you need to define who are not your enemies in case you run around making people, uh, classifying people as your enemy. Uh, because the real people your enemy are those with a motive to steal, kill and destroy. Of course, some people have no motive at all. They are used by the evil spirits without knowing because of their weaknesses. And there is an evil spirit behind usually. Uh, such people, there is no evil spirit behind. It's just their soul and the way they characterize and they, uh, and they are your, your friends who, sh who, who are like iron sharpens iron. And um, then uh, we look at the book of Acts and see that where there are differences in the ministry like they had in the book of Acts. Uh, after the Jerusalem Council, Paul and uh, Barnabas are very, very good friends. They met each other in the ministry. Uh, Barnabas uh, introduced Paul to the apostles. He was a prominent uh, good man uh, with the apostles in the church in Jerusalem. Paul uh, was a well-versed man in the things of the Word and the Scriptures and God used him mightily and they both were called at the same time in Acts 13 and they went into ministry for one whole missionary journey together. Now after the, uh, after the uh, Jerusalem Council, because they say he didn't know they're not Sanhedrin, after the Jerusalem Council, 
uh, where they settle the Gentile questions and they're about to go and embark on their second missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas had some misunderstanding. In verse 36 it says, Then after some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp because these two are very strong men that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. Paul took, chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. In uh, some other stories on this area in the, among the Apocrypha, uh, they tell how Paul and Barnabas, they wept, they cried, they prayed for each other before they sent each other off. So they left on good terms. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now here, Paul and Barnabas quarrel. They quarrel about uh, Mark. And both their strong character come in. Paul does not like people who do halfway and cannot see through something. Barnabas was someone who is a champion of the weak and the rejected. And their strong points came about. Uh, as you all know, later on in the book of Timothy, in the episode to Timothy, he mentioned Mark is a useful person to him. So later on, of course, Paul must have reconciled with Mark. Mark was a young man at that time. And uh, uh, Barnabas still supported Paul in many ways, in spite of their disagreement. So here is where two brethren can disagree, but they are not enemies. They are still brethren, they just cannot see eye to eye on the decision to take Mark. Maybe they cannot see eye to eye in many other areas. But this was a contentious issue for them. Contentious means this is something that they will quarrel about. So rather than keep quarreling, they make it into two teams. One go to one direction, the other go in the other direction. And um, Paul's story continue, Barnabas' story continue. These are good friends who disagree. Uh, the opposite of enemy is a friend. So these are not enemies, these are good friends. Good friends who disagree and who agree to be apart for a while. Uh, and uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas still met from time to time and Paul in the end uh, was able to accept John Mark. But as good friends, uh, they were quarreling too much about John Mark and it would not be a pleasant journey. So they decided to go separate ways for a time, even though God called both of them at the same time. And so Paul also took Silas and, uh, with him, uh, who was formerly a prophet too, and uh, well, Barnabas took Mark, and they both got two teams going different directions. But they are friends and not enemies. So don't think your church elder, church leader, church pastors, or pastors don't think your church uh, uh, leadership or board or all that are your enemies. These are friends. Friends who seek to work together, try to work together. Sometimes in some areas they can work together. In some areas they cannot work together. They are not enemies. Please. You know why I say this? Because in 40 years of ministry, I've seen how church members make enemies of each other. Such that sometimes uh, you talk to one church member and say, if this person comes to church, I don't want to come. Unless this person leaves the church, I won't come to church. What is happening here? Christians making enemies of each other unnecessarily because of the character is so different. And in the first place, who can threaten each other as to, you know, uh, I don't come to church and you don't come to church. You know, going to church is a privilege. You understand it's a privilege once the day come when there are no churches that you can go to except those that are um, uh, in the refuge zones. And once you realize the persecution, and in many countries, churches are forbidden and they can't even meet. And at the same time, you can never threaten, if it's a solid pastor who knows what they are doing, you can never threaten a pastor by your absence. I mean, what threat is that? Uh, unless a pastor is one who is a hireling and not a shepherd, and afraid of the financial loss, afraid of this or that. 
No, you can never threaten a true man, uh, man of God who is there just to serve God. And uh, your absence from the church or your presence in the church is for your own benefit. It's not for anybody's benefit. Nor do, are you doing God a favor by going to church. You're doing yourself a favor by going to church. So that is not something that can even be used as a threat. I don't know why people use that as a threat. And uh, perhaps they can threaten pastors who are interested in numbers and all that. For me, I don't care whether the church is small or big as long as it's united and you're doing God's perfect will. And um, so we need to understand that um, friends who are transparent and like iron sharpen iron, they are not your enemies, they're still friends. Christians who disagree with you in different areas, different way of doing things, and uh, uh, different methods of doing things, uh, and a different style of doing things are not your enemies. They are just friends whom you could not work together for some time. Give each other space to grow, and I'm sure through time everyone will grow to love the Lord and be able to accept each other the way Paul accepted John Mark. Uh, and, uh, it's all about John Mark. Paul and Barnabas had no issue. They are both grown men and mature men. It's all about John Mark. I wonder what John Mark felt like seeing his big uncles here quarreling because of him. And he went with Uncle Barney. Uh, and uh, he wondered whether Paul would ever accept him in his life. But he grew and he became a blessing to Paul. So Paul later on was a bit more compassionate and a bit more mellow and uh, he was more accepting of uh, young people like himself who could not be that steady at times. And so uh, it's just that everyone needs to grow and given time everyone will be able to accept one another. So remember in the church there will be many time differences there will be many times uh, different styles of doing things and sometimes even different understanding and different principles apply. But we don't have to make an enemy out of each other. The same that many pastors, you don't have to feel threatened because another church got planted in your backyard. And different denominational pastors didn't have to make an enemy of another pastor just because they think they're stealing your sheep. Uh, in the first place, all the sheep belong to Jesus and not to any one of us personally. And secondly, if you feed your sheep well and you nurture your sheep well, no matter where the sheep go, the sheep will always return to where the sheep is comfortable and well fed. And of course, if you beat your sheep and do things to your sheep, because the sheep will run away and look for another pasture. And so I've also seen it, how pastors become insecure afraid that they lose their members and uh, afraid that uh, they will lose the finances when the members leave the church, afraid of losing a single member and so they become very possessive pastors and they're not so open to the church at large that, that every sheep can grow from different different aspects and um, so they, in trying to protect the sheep, they over protect the sheep until the sheep don't know how to stand on their own two feet. Uh, that's an overbearing pastor. Even Jesus doesn't do that. And so uh, another ministry, another denomination, another different type of Christians or with different practices, they are not your enemies. And Christians believe different things. Some speak in tongues, some don't speak in tongues. Some believe in healing, some don't believe in healing. Some practice the gifts of the Spirit, some don't practice the gifts of the Spirit and don't believe they exist. And uh, some uh, baptize the immersion, some do it with sprinkling. And some believe in different end time messages and they even believe in uh, what you call post tribulation rapture. Some believe in pre tribulation rapture. And, uh, but all believe that Jesus Christ is the, own, the way, the truth, and the line, the only way of salvation. That's not room to call each other cults or extreme thing. They are just differences of Christianity, different style of running the church, different governmental styles. And uh, these are not your enemies either. These are all just Christians expressing their faith, their belief, and their cultural system that they come from differently. So don't just jump and make anyone an enemy. And also, 
in the book of Acts chapter 21, um, in the book of Acts chapter 21, Paul was already completing all his missionary journey and he is on his last trip to Jerusalem where he know he will be in prison. So in Acts chapter 21, verse 1 onwards, it came to pass that when we had departed from them, set sail running a straight course, we came to Kos the following day to Rhodes, from there to Patara. Uh, finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went abroad, uh, aboard and set sail. When we sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. But of course, Paul continued on his way. Who are these disciples at the fellowship at Tyre who gave Paul a prophecy and tell him not to do to Jerusalem? But Paul was going to Jerusalem because he had heard God himself. See, you're not afraid of prophecy, wrong prophecy, or misinterpreted prophecy when you yourself have already heard God's voice and God's word. And so it's just a test whether you really are sure about what God, what you have heard. Now these disciples who were at Tyre, who gave Paul a wrong prophecy, they are also not your enemies. They are also not Paul's enemies. These are just misguided uh, people with the gift of prophecy who did not operate it well. They are not your enemies either. In Christianity, there will be people with gifts and they might misuse the gifts here and there. They might misinterpret some of the things they are receiving, visions or dreams or revelations. And they might actually give you the wrong direction, opposite to what God is speaking to you. And just because someone speaks opposite from what God hears from you, does not make them your enemy. They are just doing their best, thinking that this is what the Lord is saying and trying to operate their gift in their own way. So someone who seems to be opposing what you're trying to do, we have to mention that because uh, uh, we mention an enemy, someone who, who is opposing you from doing God's will. But these people are not directly opposing because they didn't take away Paul's free will. They just speak their opinion. So whenever someone gives you counsel or whenever a gift of the Spirit works through the manifestation of the Spirit and it seems to be applied opposite to what the Lord tells you to do, does not mean that the counselors or the gift operator is your enemy. They are just doing their job that they know how, the best they think that they know how. So treat these people as uh, just Christians who did not hear what the Lord tell you and they are hearing and trying their best to hear contrary to what the Lord has here. They are not your enemies either. They are just Christians who need to grow to be more accurate, more sharp in their hearing from God. And sometimes good Christians counsel people the opposite from what God wants them to do. Yes, I've seen them in many cases. Uh, and uh, People seek counsel and instead of learning how to counsel them well, they counsel the opposite direction of what God actually wants them to do. And Don't blame the counsellors. In the end, each person is responsible there for their own free choices. But remember, never make such people your enemy because they, in good faith, they, you ask for the counsel, they give you your opinion and the opinion and counsel might be opposite from what you, you wanted them. Because some people are going around always asking for an amen and a pat on the back. They just want people to confirm what they, they hear from God. So when someone says opposite, they get upset, angry, and then they make them their enemy. Now, if you, if, in fact, if you are able to continue going the way God speaks to you, that you think God speaks to you, after the counseling that is opposite from what you, what you, you wanted, they should make you stronger. Because at least these people make you think through different things before you continue. Of course, if they are good, they also won't be insistent. Have you ever come across people who are insistent in how and what you have to do when it's your life and not their life? Oh, these people just are immature. They just need to grow. Give them a chance to grow. And uh, if they mature through the years, they realize 
You can say everything you want to a person, but never rob them of their free choice. You can operate all the gifts of the Spirit in your life, but that doesn't give you the right to give to rob a person of their free choice. So such people just lack maturity. They just they just uh, too stubborn and insistent in their own way, and uh, so they just need to grow up. That's all. Just be patient with such people, and and in a way, if God uses them in your life, it's good because it will make sure that you are really sure of what you are doing after considering all these points. And um, hopefully they are not the type who is waiting for you to fall and falter because um, uh, they believe that what they tell you is God's way. You're going opposite and then they are waiting to say, See, I told you so. And hopefully they not, don't have this kind of rotten attitude. And uh, they should know that everyone has a right to hear God for themselves and we ought to answer to the judgment seat of God. And so we pray you have good counsellors, even counsellors who might disagree with your direction to, in order to make you sure that the direction you're going is, is really of the Lord. And we, we pray that God will give you good people who learn to operate their gifts and even if they misinterpret the interpretation, just uh, the inter the, uh, in, uh, misinterpret the word and apply it wrongly, just like you see later in the book of Acts chapter 21, the people who tried to stop Paul from going to Jerusalem after Agabus gave the prophecy that the man who, who owns his belt will be in prison are good people. They love Paul. They cry for Paul. They want to protect Paul. And it's for that reason they tried to stop him from going to Jerusalem. And it's not out of uh, despising what Paul is doing. It's out of real genuine concern. So they have said what they need to say Paul say what he need to say and Paul says look don't break his heart he knew and he knows what God has spoken to him uh, in dreams in visions and in prophecy himself so Paul did the right thing by continuing to go and all the rest did the right thing in doing their best to apply things as they are so these again are not your enemies these are all people trying to do God's will, trying to give the right counsel, trying to operate the gifts as much as possible, trying to interpret as much as possible. Don't make these people your enemies. They are not your enemies. They are just Christians uh, still growing. Still growing and haven't reached perfection yet. And uh, So these are not your enemies. It's important for me to tell you who are not your enemies in case you make everyone your enemy. So when you declassify these people from your enemy list, then who are your enemies? Well, let's divide them into two groups. There are those who are not in the Lord yet, and there are those in the Lord. There are those in the Lord who might become your enemies because like Hymenaeus and Alexander they become people who hinder Paul and they were active trying to stop Paul from doing what God wants him to do so they become enemies of God they were once upon a time true believers in God and just like this group of people uh, before the Jerusalem Council in Acts, um, Joseph comes to in Acts 15, so that would be Acts uh, towards the end of Acts 14 when he went back to them. And uh, he was back in um, uh, Antioch and chapter 15, verse 1. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension, and dispute with them, they did determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. They want to settle whether the Gentiles need to keep Jewish laws to be saved, including circumcision. While Paul says, no, being born again is enough, you don't need to be circumcised, nor keep Jewish laws. And in the end, they settled, they just did observe four things. And all the other things are not important for the Gentiles. They belong to the Jews and Jewish culture. And who are these people called uh, certain men? They are 
call the circumcision party and they teach the law and want all Gentiles to keep the law. Now, among this group of people, some of them are sincere and they are good people. They just misled, misguided or too traditional to accept the Gentiles. But among this group of people are hardcore fanatics. Those are the ones who are enemies of God. And so among the believers, one should differentiate between these. Those who had this wrong teaching and wrong understanding and traditional understanding that the Gentiles need to keep Jewish laws, they were very outspoken during the meeting. It says in verse 6, the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And uh, then it tells us also that uh, in their consideration that they were doing, uh, let's uh, read in this uh, passage here. Uh, they all came together in Jer Jerusalem and continue to debate that matter. It says in verse 7, when there had been much dispute. Oh, there was arguments and dispute. Now the people who are arguing and disputing are not necessarily the enemies of God yet. They haven't yielded to the devil. So they are arguing and they are disputing. And these are all good people who perhaps have their own conscience and want to live according to their own conscience. So there are some Jews whose conscience are not trained yet in, in the ways of Gentiles and they cannot accept that a person can be saved without being a Jew. And of course Paul's gospel was controversial for, for them. So there could be good people among them who are not enemies of God. And so you have to differentiate. When you talk about who are your enemies, you have to differentiate. Those who are not in God and those who are in God. So among those in God, there are a lot of good people who are traditional, misguided. There are a lot of people who sometimes are extreme in their practices, extreme in their doctrines, but they're not enemies of God. They do hurt a lot of sheep by their extreme and ways, but they're not enemies of God. They're just imperfect people who need guidance, who need help. But out of this group who are believers, after the Jerusalem Council, there is a core stubborn group who refuse to accept the dictates of the council. The church has already met, the elders and the apostles already met, and they understand the doctrine, they understand what is right and wrong to do for the Jews and for the Gentiles. They agree what was right and wrong for the Gentiles and they cannot accept it. When people reject the apostles and the apostles' counsel, people like Apostle Paul too, that is when they start differentiating themselves as a different group among the believers. Over time, in the book of Galatians, they became the enemies of Paul and the enemies of God. You read some of the extreme cases. They are called the Judaizers. Paul was actually a little bit strong in his writing in Galatians because Paul called them dogs. Oh yeah, this apostle Paul can be very fierce in his argument. And uh, because he preached the gospel to the Gentiles and he applied the rule of Jerusalem council in Acts 15 that said the Gentiles just tell them don't, don't, don't uh, partake with idol, uh, don't worship idols and don't, uh, don't sin and don't uh, uh, eat uh, the, the animal's blood and all, all these uh, simple things. And, uh, but there is a group from the circumcision. You look at what Paul says in the book of Galatians chapter 2. These are quite an influential group that Paul really in the end identified them as enemies. They are like, neither here nor there other Paul make a mark and say these are enemies. In verse 11, he says, when, when Peter was visiting Antioch, he says, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Why? Because when Peter came, he ate with the Gentiles. He's a Jew. Now remember, 
True Jews don't sit down with Gentiles for a meal. The Orthodox. They have to sit in separate table. And they have their laws, their customs to follow. So Peter, when he was uh, with the church, he sat with the Gentiles, no problem. But when the Jews came, he quickly go aside and Paul was upset at him. Because Paul himself was a Jew and he sat with the Gentiles. Because Christianity has now made the two one. Jews and Gentiles are no more. He says, I withstood him. In verse 12, for before certain men came from James, they're so afraid of James the Elder, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with the hypocrisy. And Paul said he stood up and scolded everyone <laughs> for the hypocrisy. Now at this stage, the circumcision party, oh, what a name, was like, neither bad nor good but more leaning towards the bad now because it was an evolution through time where as more and more Gentiles get saved the doctrine that Gentiles don't to be Jews become clearer and clearer and those who want to force the Gentiles to, to, to be circumcised to, to be saved for their salvation is now actually acting contradictory to the doctrine of salvation by grace and, uh, and it's against the gospel which God had given to Paul. So Paul is at the stage of classifying them as an enemy. And by the end of Galatians, he called them that. He called him that. He says, if you still believe that way, you are an enemy of God. And um, <clears throat> so he scolded Peter because the Jewish church, the Jerusalem church was mainly a Jewish church. So, they, so they, they, those people could be in their midst without any problem because everyone around them is keeping the Jewish laws. But when such people come to the Gentile church, then it becomes obvious how wrong they are. The traditionalism has become terrible. And Paul scolded the Galatians. He says, Galatians, in chapter 3, who bewitch you that you should... You should not obey the truth about Jesus Christ and go to all this circumcision party and do all these wrong things, uh, thinking that you have to do all those things to be saved. He literally uh, scolded them. Then he argued from a theology point that, that grace came before the law. When the law came, it was only temporarily. But we are back to the grace of God and, and the faith that God has chosen to reveal. In other words, you don't need to be circumcised. Don't follow such people. And um, verse 17, uh, Galatians uh, chapter 4, he said, They zealously caught you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. But it's good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I'm present with you. And Paul says, you know, don't, don't go to the wrong thing. And uh, don't go in such a direction. Don't go back to the law, he says. Uh, so he continues teaching. And uh, he says in chapter 5, Wow, these are strict, very, very powerful, strict words he says to them. In chapter 5, verse 1, Stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He called it a yoke of bondage. See, he's starting to classify such people as an enemy. See the evolution to them. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you, if you become circumcised, if you follow such circumcision but and become circumcised, Christ profits you nothing. As I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised, he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, they separated from Christ, uh, who attempt to be justified by the law, and you have, Paul used the word, you have, look at these words, chapter 5 verse 4, in Galatians, you have fallen from grace. Oh, Paul is making these people his enemy. For in Christ, in verse 6, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. Only Jesus avails to all. And um, Paul asked every man to examine himself and uh, tell them not to be circumcised. He says, don't go uh, the wrong way, he says to them. Galatia, in Galatians chapter 6, Paul writes strongly 
Wow, he's really uh, with full emotions. He says, see, uh, it was 11. What large letters I have written to you with my own hand? As many as desire to make good show in the flesh, this to compel you to be circumcised, uh, only that they may suffer, not suffer persecution for the cross. He says, so even those who say keep the law, but they desire to keep you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh, Paul says. And actually in strong words when he write this epistle, he even saw those who want to do such thing to you, let them go and castrate themselves. Well, he used such words, not just circumcised, like castrate themselves. And uh, later on, you know, when he writes uh, the epistle, he begins to find that these Judaizers are his enemies and they became his enemies. They truly became his enemies. And um, uh, in the scripture, um, you have uh, this uh, little passage here. In the scripture, in the book of Philippians, uh, Paul uh, began to call these people and he says um, in uh, uh, verse, uh, chapter 3 of Philippians, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Now, who is Paul talking about? Is he talking about dogs? Hey, I love dogs. I have pet dogs before. And many of you out there, you love dogs. Some of you are cat people, some of you are dog people, some of you are lion people, camel people, whatever. Anyway, what does Paul mean by beware of dogs? That, that scripture. So when you, look, when, when, when you look out and you go for a walk, walk or walk and you see a sign on the gate, beware of dogs, you can write there, it's, well, don't do that. But you could easily write there, uh, Philippians 3 verse 2. <laughs> beware of dogs, that's from the Bible. And uh, Paul is not talking about real dogs. He actually classified the circumcision party, or what we call the Judaizers, people who want the Gentile keep Jewish laws, dogs. Anjing in Malay. Woof! Woof! Beware of woof! Woof! And he's not talking about real dogs. Paul really, really strong, don't you think so? He called these people dogs. And then he says, beware of evil doers, evil workers. He called them evil workers. Because Paul is very strong on grace and against people who put people back to Jewish laws and customs. To be safe, especially. I mean, you know, keep them, you know, for, for identification, for, for cultural reasons. That's no problem. But for salvation, no, only Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And then he say, beware of the mutilation. In other words, beware of such people who want to castrate you. Oh my God, he's using such strong words here. Calling himself a Pharisee of the Pharisee, Hebrew of the Hebrews. And uh, Paul made such people his enemy because they are now preaching the message that will upset salvation by grace that he has taught for so many years. So we say, who are your enemies? There are Christians who are sincere, sincerely and doctrinally wrong, sincerely but practically wrong, sincerely but in principle wrong, sincerely, you know, but with so many errors in their life, and they are not your enemies, and some of them might be just ignorant, or like what Paul said in First Corinthians, unlearned, untaught. But there are those who are hardcore in doing the wrong thing, persistent, after the Jerusalem Council, after the church say what is right and what is wrong, they still call wrong right. That is where they became the enemy of God. And in the book of Revelations, uh, Jesus talked about a group of people that came out several times. They are called the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans. In chapter 2, verse 6 of Revelations, says, but this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which, who, which I also hate, Jesus says. So who are the Nicolaitans? Uh, from church history and early church writings, the Nicolaitans were followers of one of the seven deacons, Nicholas the proselyte. For some reason, there was some wrong teaching that came about. And so it went extreme. Nicholas himself might be an okay guy, but uh, maybe his followers and later on become extreme. And uh, so it reached a point where it was just uh, extreme Christianity. Then maybe it goes too far 
where they begin to be against Christ, against the spirit of Christ, against the doctrine of Christ, that's when Jesus himself made them his enemy. Uh, an example of that is like, for example, uh, most of us have heard of Washman Nee, and uh, he was a tremendous teacher. I read all his writings. In fact, all his writings are good. And one book that needs a bit of a clarification is um, The Latent Power of the Soul. And that one, you need to classify that not all of the soul is necessarily bad. But in that book, he classifies 100% of the soul is bad. If that is so, then how can God tell you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength? So obviously, the soul under the power of the Spirit is okay, it's good. And uh, so, uh, that part needs a bit of clarification. Washmany started a group or church, the denomination called Little Flock. Later on, it was taken over by a name man, man named Witness Lee. Witness Lee brought Washmany's writing to another whole degree, uh, such that they are the only true church and um, that uh, every other church is wrong and then uh, uh, until some people say I'm not sure how, whether it's true or not that when he preached he liked to make sounds the like way watch many make sounds when his teeth uh, roll together kind of thing and, and watch many did it because there was some problem with his teeth witnessly did that because he's copying watch many so uh, then it became more and more extreme. I'm, I'm sure today there are genuine believers under the little flock who are not so extreme anymore. But at one point under witness, it became so extreme that they think they're the only true church and nobody else was correct. So that is extreme, but still not an enemy of God yet because they still believe in Jesus Christ. And so you can see that uh, I'm quite liberal. I allow a lot of allowances and differences, and you don't simply classify anyone as an enemy. An enemy is only like the Nicolaitans, who make themselves an enemy of God, or like the Judaizers in Paul's time, who completely contradict the dictates of the apostles in Jerusalem, Council in chapter 15, who contradict Paul's gospel to the Gentiles. They want them to be saved all over again by keeping Jewish laws. And that was an, uh, anti-gospel for Paul, classified as an enemy. So here, among those believers, how do we differentiate? There can be potential enemies that grow out from extreme Christianity. And we need to keep a watch for that. Because extreme Christianity, just a slight twist, might teach something wrong. Like for example, when you have the faith movement, which still is okay, then uh, you have extreme faith movement where they begin to go against medicine. And there is such a movement led by some people. So I won't consider them enemies yet, but I consider them they cause a lot of hurt in the body of Christ. And a lot of harm. But they still believe Jesus is the Christ, and so they are just extreme to me. But if they ever go to the stage uh, of, uh, of teaching another gospel, another salvation, then that is where you cross a line, or another way of salvation except Christ. And so there is a potential for extreme teaching to turn on its own head and become uh, completely against God, against Jesus. So with such, you keep an eye, because could be among them, Satan just had to influence and twist a few more doctrines until they no longer need Jesus and, and, and then they begin to think they're, they're, they're the saviour and that's the end of it. And uh, only Jesus is the way, the truth and the life and the only saviour and Lord. So that's how you identify enemies within, you've got to keep a watchful eye and I say potentially they could rise up among extreme Christianity. Then among, among the unbelievers, in fact, some of the cults that come out came from extreme Christianity. And even Sun Myan Moon, uh, in his early life, he was always fasting, always reading the Bible, but then he came to the wrong conclusion that he was the Messiah, he was the one, and when Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So that is completely a cult. How do we differentiate between a cult and true Christianity, including extreme ones? Jesus. Who they say Jesus is. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the only way to God and the Savior. And how do you differentiate 
within a cult in true Christianity that Jesus is the only salvation. There's no other way to God except to Jesus. So no matter how funny, extreme or different practices, they are still within the realms of Christianity. Only when they change the method of salvation, that's when it becomes a cult. Any other way to God except Jesus, our Lord and Savior, accepting Christ into your heart and life, the atonement and redemption of Christ, anything outside of that, any other salvation becomes a cult. And then that becomes the enemy of God. So there are extreme people within the group that oppose the gospel and oppose what God is doing. And I believe Hermanias and Alexander and Nicholas followers, the Nicolaitans, reach an extreme where they began outside Christianity and began to oppose God. So it becomes a question of being an enemy of God. Jesus said something in his Sermon on the Mount. He says that some will come to him, Lord, say, Lord, Lord. But Jesus said, I don't know you. And they claim to have done this and done that. But Jesus says, I don't know you. You, you do us of wickedness. So there could be some from within uh, Christianity who go to the extreme and then they oppose God without realizing it perhaps. But to such, they lost their salvation. In the book of Hebrews, it tells us it is possible for those who once have tasted the good word of God and uh, who once even know different areas uh, of the truth, that once they reject, you see the key is rejecting Jesus. Once you reject Jesus, that's the end. It says in verse uh, 4 to 6, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, have tasted the heavenly gift, and become partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God, and put Him to an open shame. That means they reject Christ. The key is the rejection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So these are the people that the Bible says once knew God but doesn't and they are opposing God and um, then we have uh, of course First John chapter 5 First John chapter 5 it talks about praying for different people and it says there in verse 16 and 17 if anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask. He will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not leading to death. That means they cross the line where they sin unto death. They become an enemy of God. Because those who are outside, those days, those who are inside and they leave the faith, they leave Jesus Christ, they left the salvation, they reject Jesus, then they become enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And that's not good. We pray that such do not happen to people who are ignorant or who are innocently or ignorantly being used by God against Jesus himself. The amazing thing about loving your enemy Watch how Jesus treated Judas Iscariot. Right until the last chance. When did Judas Iscariot lose his salvation? Isn't that an interesting thought? When? When did he become full-fledged enemy of Jesus? He was already plotting behind. I mean, that was a terrible thing. But he was still considered safe until at the Lord's Supper. When Jesus gave the warning and said, one of you will betray me, he was in the midst. And then when he has taken the best part, which is given to usually a privileged person, when Jesus soak and feed the person, and Jesus said, what you do, do quickly. And he still did not repent still did not choose to turn, turn back. The Bible says, Satan entered into him. That's when he lost his salvation. 
He was borderline, borderline, ready about to jump off the cliff. And that's when he seen unto death, cross the line. But at all times did you know that when Jesus did all the nice things to disciples, washed their feet and all those things, Judas was still there. So understand that you don't simply classify people as an enemy. You give them the best chance possible for them to turn around, especially if they're from inside. If they're from inside, before they turn, they have to turn based on their true evil, not because they have not been loved enough. And so, Judas was loved sufficiently by the Lord. In the end, when he turned against Jesus and betrayed him with a kiss, because he gave a signal, whomever I kiss is the one, arrest him. So, Jesus knows, Judas, I'll betray us, son of man, with a kiss. So sad, the story. But this series is on love your enemy. He was working against Jesus all the time and Jesus knew it. He was fronting himself a disciple of Jesus and Jesus knew it. But Jesus loved him right to the end. Jesus tried to warn him and he had no excuse after he lost his salvation. So for those among us, there is a danger zone. When people cross a danger zone, you and I as followers of Jesus should not follow. If they go that way, I'm not going that way. If they reject Jesus, I'm never going to reject Jesus. If they reject the Word of God, I'm not going to reject the Word of God. If they reject the true visions and revelation God has given and the Word delivered by His angels in this end time, I'm not going to reject. But those people are borderline. A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, they may enter the sin unto death. So for such, we should pray for them. And as long as they haven't sinned unto death, still can pray for them. Once they cross the line, this fellowship is the only way through. So as we learn, about the compassion and the love of Jesus and learn to understand about loving our enemy. Today we look at the fact of who our enemy is. And we see that it's not easy for a person to become an enemy of Christ. A person must first be deceived. A person must first reject the message, must reject the message of Jesus. You think it's easy to re accept Jesus' message? He's a Messiah in his time. Let me tell you, it's not easy either. And Judas find it hard to accept the message that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus was the Son of God. Because if he accepts Jesus as God and Son of God, do you think he would have betrayed Jesus? No. He saw Jesus only as a man. That's why he can betray a man. He would not dare to betray a God. He cannot see that Jesus was God. And he treat Jesus as a man. But today he's burning in the fires of hell. We are touching the holy. This message of the end time and the things we are handling are so precious. We do it fasting and prayer. 40 days, 80 days. We dare not go against God or the word of God that is so precious that can save millions of lives. To prepare the people for this end time. But those who see only as a word of a man or the words or dreams and imaginations of man can so easily reject it. May God have mercy that they don't cross the line to betray Jesus, the Son of Man and the message of Jesus. Judas play around with fire and regard Jesus as an ordinary man to his fall. Those who regard 
the words that the angels bring they are in line let me say with the word of god words are in line and warnings about this end times they are specially given in this end time and that we have preached word that is from the Bible. We show how the revival is from God. Daniel 2.44 In the days of the ten toes, the kingdom of God will be established. And of how God is setting up His kingdom. And of the shaking that will come on the earth that is in the Bible. God says, I will shake the earth once again. This is in your Bible. Confirmed by the word angels not the words of a man. None of us have enough imagination to create the story that we have told you about how this end time was started. Understand, there's a penalty for re rejecting the word of God. Rejecting the words of man, fair and square, go away. But when it's thus says the Lord and the word of God, we should fear and tremble at the judgment seat of God. So pray for your enemy. Love your enemy. Especially those who haven't become enemies of God yet. That perhaps this is their last chance. Thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy. Open the eyes of those who are sincere. Open the eyes all over the world of those who are blind. Let them see the glory of Pagamas, the glory of God, the glory of this message, of your word for this end time. Let them hear the voice that is calling to them to wake up the midnight cry. Let them know we are in the end time and we are in the second set, seven years of famine. Seven years have passed, a new seven have begun. And then there will be the third seven years of war. Everything is according to your word. Let your word go forth mightily. And let it be unto us according to your word. In Jesus' name.